we have something that's a real treat right now, and uh, that is we're going to have a kind of a Q&A panel uh, discussion, and we're going to have our host, Damon, join us up here on stage, as well as uh, Terry and Leanne, as she hugs everybody over there. Um, <laughs> and we're just going to, we're going to gather up here, and we're going to let them sit down, and uh, we're going to be able to ask any questions that we want to um, of them. Now, I, I don't want to ask them how long they've been doing this, because that might give away their age and stuff, but I bet you there are decades upon decades upon decades of worship leading experience here, uh, up here on the, on the platform. And so you can ask any questions you want of them. And I know we have everybody from college students here on through people who uh, are, are part of churches. And, and uh, so really, you're going to be able to um, uh, ask any questions you want. So I want you to think about that. I'm going to have the mic, and I'm actually going to bring the mic to you. And you may say, well, why do we need a mic in here? I think we can hear everybody. We're actually recording this, and we're also broadcasting live online right now. So there might be pe some people uh, hearing it or watching it now, or possibly later down the road, and we want to make sure they can hear your questions. So uh, if you just raise your hand, I'll come to you and, uh, and let you ask your question. So I want you to be thinking about your question. And uh, do we have mics for everybody up here? We got, we got one. Okay, so, and two. What, you want one? Uh, we're good? Oh, and Damon, you got one? Oh, okay, just a second. We'll get Damon a mic. There you go. We'll get you one here. There you go. All right, so we got three. Do you, do you guys want to begin, like, maybe just a, like a brief philosophy of leading worship, and then we'll move into question and answer, and I'll just be available to, to run around when you want me to. Okay. <laughs> oh, worship is, to me, it's a love exchange, and it's a response to what God's, who he is and what he's done. The greatest thing that he did was provide the way that we can come in and participate with him. That is such an honor. And that's what worship is. It's coming in to me, that's my thought, to, to be with him and be changed by him, re renewed by him. Um, I was thinking yesterday of a definition that Charlotte Baker gave many years ago. And uh, I love it. It's worship is extreme, extravagant love, extreme obedience. And I love that. We just pour out extravagantly and because we love, we obey. So extravagant love, extreme obedience, response to him. Tag. <laughs> uh, wow, what a loaded question that is, isn't it? Uh, my whole thing about worship is there's just nothing greater than being before our king. And when you read about the life of David uh, and so much, and especially in the book of Psalms, you see a man who's gone through many highs and many lows, but worship was the one constant that he used to reconnect with God. And to me, it's like staying, you know, if you don't have that, you don't have anything in life because it keeps us in line with his heartbeat. And I use this reference quite a bit about, you know, my iPhone's got to be synced in the computer with iTunes to get the latest updates and downloads and everything to work properly. And that's kind of how we are, you know. I've got to get in sync with the King every day. And worship is the avenue in which we're all called to be because he's looking for worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And I just love that people want to worship that have been called by his name. And so we're doing a setting like this conference and you find out really fast how much people really want to worship him because we've seen just the level of the glory and intimacy in each session. And so when it comes to about worship, I just want to reconnect with the one I'm in love with, the one who created me, and I want to take people with me into that journey. Hello. Well, Pastor Darrell said philosophy. That's a four-syllable word, and my mental capabilities cut off at three syllables <laughs> as a rule. But um, 
I like what both of these folks have said. I agree with all that. And I guess as a, as a leader for many, many years now, there's been one thing that, um, that I keep in front of me and what worship leading is to me. It's about him and it's about them. And um, when I feel the congregation has taken over and become that element of worship offering to the Lord, my job as a leader has not only completed, it's just gotten a lot easier because that's what I'm after in every service. My concern in this day and age is, and that's a, that's a whole nother carton of night crawlers that I don't really want to open, but there's, a, there's so much emphasis on the platform that the people are being left to spectate. And it saddens the heart of the Lord because this is the bride, not just a half a dozen people up here. This is all the bride. And if we are robbing them of the blessing of giving, like I said last night, the lady in red can only offer a God a song that nobody else can offer. And that's just the way it is. And we can't rob them of that. We shouldn't be writing songs that are in such high keys that the men in the church can't even sing. What I appreciated about Leanne today, she was singing in a key that was what I call congregation friendly. Today, the rage is to, to, to write songs to where high tenors can sing it, but you have plumbers and electricians and bank presidents that if they're going to sing along, they have to drop it down an octave. And that's changing everything for the male voice in the worship service. There's no power when you're weighed down here. You have to sing like this. But who can sing up with, unless you're a music major or a voice major, who can sing up there? And I've run into that all across the country. And to me, what it's saying is, we're more important than you. You are the reason that this exists. If there's nobody out there, Brother Daryl, why have a, a worship team? So it's about the people. You're the, you're the performers. You're the actors, if you will. He's the audience. And we should just be getting you into the place where you can perform and minister to your king. So it's about him first, and it's about them. When it becomes about me more than you, I've gotten something way out of whack. Man, what a kickoff to just the first question there. That's, that's like a whole... No more four-syllable questions. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's like a whole seminary class right there. That was fantastic. <laughs> you know, I'm going to ask us if we can bring the house lights full just so everybody can see each other. And who would like to give, just ask the first question? I'll bring the mic to you. All right, Tyler, I'm going to bring the mic and just uh, state your name, serial number, address, no, bank account, no. Just um, I had a question. Um, as it comes to like songwriting and getting in that place where um, you really, you want to say what God puts on your heart. You know, you want to say what God wants to say through a song. Um, how do you like get to that place? Like how do you, I guess like not really, sort of like realize that like what you're saying is what God wants to say and then how do you like decipher it between like what you want to say and what you think God wants you to say? You, you know what I mean. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Tyler. Wow. Um, I think the, the most ef effective songs that people will join me in singing um, have come out of my worship time. And as I'm worshiping, and a song comes, and it's from my heart, then I recognize after the fact, huh, I bet some other people could join me in saying this to the Lord. Um, I remember I was in the living room with the family. We were all watching some program, and the Lord said, if you go to your bedroom right now, I'll give you a song. And I went, Oh, okay. So I just said, excuse me, I'll be back. And 20 minutes later, there was the song. So I think it's an obedience thing. 
Sometimes he's telling you to do something. I don't th it's just flowing out of worship. And I haven't written tons of songs, but you guys, you know, Terry, you could probably speak to some of that. Well, I haven't written anything that has had any merit if it was written outside of just a, a presence relationship with the Lord. I haven't sat down at the piano with a pencil and a paper and just decided to scratch out a catchy tune. If I do, it never goes anywhere. But when I've written those things out of something that's just happened, connected between he and I, which is how it was when I've written any song of any value, those are the songs that stick. You know, those are the songs. They're just coming born out of relationship. They just... A successful writer can't just know about God. You've got to know God if you're going to write successful songs that are going to minister to people and remain with people. Um, and I'm... It's going to sound like I'm picking on today a little bit, today's music a little bit, but I love to sing songs that I can learn on Sunday and then go home and the melody is so catchy that I can't get it out of my head. It's, I go to my prayer time and there's that song we sang. And less and less right now in this time am I finding those kind of melodies that are singable and remember and memorable. Um, I don't know. That's just kind of where, where I am. It's, 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 we can do better than we are doing a lot right now. Uh, we can do better. But, um, yeah, my best songs are songs that are born out of that time. And, you know, when you're writing, you say, how do you know? Got to make sure it lines up with what God's Word has said, and you're not writing something that goes contradictory to what He says. And uh, that's always a good practice, is make sure it lines up with, with biblical scripture and that's that's a good first check mark you know so that i'm not introducing a new theology to the church <laughs> just for kicks but the melody's great <laughs> i wouldn't be able to add very much to that except what i'd like to uh tag on that i find that when i write a song i do want to go to the bible i do want to find something that what God has given me is anchoring to something in that passage or a chapter or a verse. Uh, I think it's important to be really scripturally sound in our songwriting. And I couldn't agree more with what he said. You know, simple is more in songwriting. You know, it doesn't need to be 15 verses. You know, you can say a lot in three lines and it will have the same anointing, you know, if God's on it. And so that's what I love about the songs that he writes and some others that I really look up to and respect, those who really hear the sound of heaven and want to release those very songs that are memorable, they're singable, and they stay in your heart and spirit, you know, because there's true, there's many songs that they're great on K-Love or a radio station, but I'll forget them 30 minutes later. They have no lasting impact on me. So, but the bottom line is I love to go scriptural when God gives me a song. I really want to seek that out in my songwriting. I think that's true and as a, as a non-musical person I think the thing I appreciate about all three of you, even last night when we were maybe introducing a song that maybe somebody hasn't heard, they pick it up almost before the course is even over. They're already, they already understand it, they know it and they sing it. I appreciate that very much. Who has our second question? I can bring you the mic. Hi, my name is Cheryl, and it's wonderful to have, I feel very blessed and honored to have all of you and just sit under your ministry and teaching, and so thank you very much. Um, I, it's, I, it's not really a really clear formulated question, but it's about um, uh, entering in, the process, the process of leading people and the process of entering in and where you start in the outer court. And I know there's differences of different songs that maybe uh, you feel the Lord might want you to use for those different steps. But from moving, are there any nuggets of truth? I guess the main, my main thought is, are there any nuggets of truth you've learned through all the years of ministry experience and even how the Holy Spirit moves people into the Holy of Holies, are nuggets of truth about that process and how you all experience that. It's probably different for each of you, but it's, it's a, just a question I thought that might be great to hear your wonderful answers. Thank you. Very good. 
I guess I'll start this one. <laughs> um, hmm, Holy of Holies. It has to start with just you and God first. I mean, that's the bottom line. I know even before God even brought me into the place of just leading worship, even, you know, from a worship leader just starting out, I mean, I spent a lot of time just praising him just one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I think it's always got to be relationship. They've said it already. It's all about the relationship with the king. It's a relationship. That's where it goes. But as you know, in a relationship, the more you become intimate with him, the deeper he takes you. And so then you begin to understand and you begin to discern things, you know, in the spirit, so to speak, when you're leading worship. Um, and then how to choose the right songs is that, man, I just pray. Holy Spirit, what do I need to do for this service tonight? Because there's going to be somebody here who's going to need to hear something from heaven tonight that's going to change them. They're going to change their circumstance, their life somehow. And... Um, I, I told Terry this just, oh, it was a while back ago, but, you know, a year ago, there were some things I was just kind of dealing with and kind of come out of this funk, and it was his song, I Sing Praises to Your Name, and I was using it all the time, but it was, but that's the song I needed for my season I was in. And it was because I needed to put my praises towards him, and I don't know what I was going through or thinking. So there's seasons for different things, seasons for certain songs, um, but it's always an ongoing process. It never, you never get it figured out. There's not an answer that's, this is how you do it, one, two, three. It's where you are in your relationship, maturity in Him, and, and just hearing the voice of God on a regular basis. I think, uh, uh, to me, the, the apex or the very best combination in a worship service is singing a song that was born in the presence of God by a singer who is full of the Holy Spirit to a congregation who is alive and receptive of spirit-filled music. Those are three things that rarely all come together. Sometimes you'll have a great song. I always think of Shout to the Lord that Darlene Check wrote. You had a song that was obviously born around the throne of God. I, I've never heard her story behind the song. I would venture to place a large wager that it wasn't something she just decided to write one day. It came out of an experience. So you have a, an anointed song sung by an anointed psalmist. And when we first heard it, it would have been received by the Hillsong congregation of many thousands. And that was just top impact on all three levels. Sometimes you have an anointed song sung by a non-anointed singer on the radio or in church. Sometimes you have two of those things working, but the congregation is not receptive of spiritual things because they haven't gone there with God, and so it's not as effective, but it has a measure of effectiveness. But I would certainly always like to shoot for all three. And um, again, in my services, I can tell when the anointing on the platform transfers to the pew. And I'll, I'll be honest, sometimes it happens and a lot of times it doesn't. Doesn't mean that God's not doing individual things. Great things happen in every service as long as the believer gets plugged in. But I'm always looking for the corporate change to take place. And I can always feel it when it goes from here to here. And what a difference, what a release happens right then. It's that, that draw that comes out of of the people on the anointing that's inside of me. And that's when we really start having church. <laughs> but, but it's not always there. And you just, gotta, you just gotta do what you can. You do your part, and it's up to God to do his part. So that's the way that kind of works for me. I'm thinking of the word that comes to mind in, in terms of preparation. Of course, musically we're gonna be prepared, but um, prepared in heart. Um, and then you can prepare the people. If you, if you are a worship leader in a local body, so you're there all the time, you have the opportunity to instruct. So that like w when a, a Terry would come in, they know how to move already. Um, and I think that sits on the responsibility of the local body of teaching how the movement of the Holy Spirit works. And, and they come tuned. In terms of personal preparation as a leader, uh, 
You know, it really has nothing to do with us individually because we can be like, you know, you were saying, Damon, that you had a time last year, you know, this summer was kind of tough for me. But all those things get put aside. Well, you, you give them to the Lord. But when you're getting ready to prepare for a service and how you're supposed to lead this congregation, the Holy Spirit knows all things. He knows all things. And so when he starts laying out a list, and, and sometimes there's one song that just won't go away in my head and in my heart. And I may not know a whole bunch of other stuff, but that song has to be sung. And then things start to get built around that piece. And um, I don't know if this is helpful, but this is, to me, it's the Holy Spirit that knows who's going to be there and what he wants to say. Um, I, that's the thing about, I love about the Holy Spirit. He can start things in motion two weeks before, and maybe somebody very specific is going to be there. You don't have a clue. You know, I, I was just thinking about the baptismal service, and, and the Lord just said, we have to sing rescue. And I went, okay, yes, sir. So we sang rescue for the baptismal service. And it was the lady getting baptized that it just, it was her song. I didn't know that. And I don't think as leaders, we don't know much of anything <laughs> except but what the Holy Spirit says. So, I, you know, preparation in the Holy Spirit, and you can, as a local body, teach your congregation so they can be prepared as well. Excellent questions. Keep it going. Oh, got you next. Hello, my name is Robert. Um, uh, it's a privilege to see you all there. However, I uh, just wanted to allude to a fact. Last night, um, uh, I want to call him Pastor Terry, but uh, <laughs> Minister Terry shared a word saying there's a new sound aligning with heaven that's coming, which is a new sound. And I wanted to know what was the musical direction, because see, I came up in an era where the choirs were the big things, you know, the, the full choir. And then, then it narrowed down to the praise and worship team. Now, you go to most churches, you don't see mo mostly choirs. You see praise and worship teams now. So the, where is your aspect, being a worship leader, seeing the music uh, direction flowing? Is it going to stay with the praise and worship? Or, or, or are we going to really hear this new sound? I'm excited about the new sound, to be honest with you. Amen. That's aligned with heaven. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Well, I don't know. I mean, we can't produce the new sound. I'm saying, I should say, we can't manufacture it. Um, choirs and worship teams, things change, people change, styles change. Uh, I love big church choirs. I love worship teams. I love individual artists. God can use it all. Um, but I think that uh, what I was touching on last night is there is a new thing that has to be born. You see, my, philo my philo philosophy, <laughs> my belief is that America is where America is because the church has dropped the ball. We point so many places and so goes the church, so goes the nation. The church isn't going. So we're, we're in desperate need of something to be birthed that is not like the old because we need desperate new life in the church. Um, if the church was making the statement it should make, the correct leaders would always be in the White House because there's enough voting in the church to sway any election. But we had 30 million Christians that stayed at home last election. What can you do? Why is that? Because the church is not alive in the way that it should be. I'm not talking about every church in every town. I'm talking about the movement of the church in America. So I don't know where this new sound is coming from. I just know that personally I am done with the old. I am desperate for the new in my own ministry. Because I've had it prophesied for three years. Oh, God is going to do something brand new through you. I can't, I can't unlock a door for the new thing to come out, but I have to get my heart to a place where I can receive that new thing. 
And then I'll leave it to God to just multiply it as he wishes so that it, you know, God is our promoter. We can tr try to promote until the day is done and I don't get anywhere. He's my promoter. That's the way it's always been in my ministry. The harder I tried, the worse things got. And then as I humbled myself, he moved me out in his timing. But I do, I want to... I want to be ready and I want to be actively used in this new move of God because we've got to wake up as the body of Christ. We've got to wake up. We're playing too many games. And... My name is Chris and... Ooh. Uh, just had about, you know, 10 minutes to think of a question. How to frame this. I, I'm very left brain in, you know, math science, and I, I so depended on incredible worship from, from the throne room to help me get into that other side and come into his presence. And it's taken years. Now I can just say Jesus, and whew, it falls. So thanks to what you do, I, I just, yeah, just amazed. My past, my late husband was very musical. He used to sing little ditties, but sometimes he would sing love songs over me. Now, I was very un not used to stuff like that at all in my life, and actually it was uncomfortable until I could tr somehow trust that. I don't know what, how to say that. But I find with the word, it's often a love letter to us. Now, when you receive your worship from God, it's often us worshiping Him. Do you ever receive songs that are purely His worship of love over you, for, you know, for yourself or for others? Good question. I know for me, there's been moments where I've been worshiping God, especially in my alone time. And God has surprised me. And, um, and I'll begin just to weep. And it's like I could, it's hard to describe, but basically I just feel like he's saying, you know how much I enjoy you worshiping me, but I want you to enjoy how much I love you. And he goes, because you took the time to spend with me today. Which then makes me a more of a wreck and a mess than I already was. <laughs> but... That, to me, is what God wants to do anyway with each and every one of us. And like he's saying about moving from the, the, the presence and the glory and the anointing, moving from the platform to out here, that's what it's about. Him saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe I get to come and be with my kids tonight. Because they want me up here, but they want me down there too. And it's an amazing thing to happen when God reflects his love and how much he just adores you back upon you. It's, it's very hard to put into words, honestly. Um, I just think of Zephaniah, that he rejoices over us with singing. And when we are in communion with him, I feel that. Are you, it's probably what you're talking about. We can sense him singing over us if we're actually in a love exchange relationship close enough to actually hear him and sense his presence. <clears throat> I, can, I can sense him singing over me or, you know, you probably can too. In terms of writing a song from him to the people, I don't hear a lot of those and I can't say that I've written one. And maybe because at that moment I feel like it's so personal. Um, I don't know. And, and when we're talking about worship, from our part, I feel that's what we end up writing songs about. It's about us worshiping him. He doesn't worship us. He loves us. Yeah. You know, he loves us. We worship him. <laughs> We can't live without him. He could live without us, but he, he, he chooses not to. <laughs> he said, I have chosen you. You are mine. <laughs> you know? So that's the amazing thing. So I don't know. 
I haven't written songs from him to us. Um, I don't doubt that there are songs out there uh, by, uh, by other composers, and people who have just had experiences. Um, sometimes I sing the secular song, You Are So Beautiful to Me, which was actually written from a Christian perspective by Billy Preston. He was writing that to God. And Joe Cocker recorded it as a secular song. But sometimes when I sing that, I flip it around and I say, now listen to the Lord sing to you. And he says, you are so beautiful to me. Can't you see? You're everything I died for. I want to see you free. And um, so I've twisted songs like that occasionally, but yeah, that's about the extent of it. But that's a good point. I mean, we could write songs that way. I just guess the Lord hasn't moved through us personally, but doesn't mean he hasn't moved through others that way. It's kind of cool. Who's next? Come on now. You know, uh, coaching is all the rave right now. You, you hire that coach or that life coach and you spend a lot of money to, to have time with that coach. You've got three awesome coaches up here. So what do you want to ask? Ask anything. All right. No, whoa, whoa, you already had one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. While he's asking, you guys think of it. This is a great opportunity for Second everybody. question requires a $10 minimum now. <laughs> oh, man. No, no. Who, who is some of your mentors that help, you know, birth in your life uh, uh, in, in, in worship leading, you know? Uh, you know, who, who are some people that inspired you while you're in your ministry? Well, I have to honestly say for me, uh, when I first really came into the whole worship thing in the 90s, it was, you know, it was Darlene Check. It was Shout to the Lord. I mean, that, all that just hit at the same time for me. And, and what they were writing at that moment, those songs that were coming out from Reuben Morgan and some of those other guys at the time, they were writing songs. I was like, yes, that's my heartbeat. That's what I wanted to sing to God. And they're putting it in words and in melodies that, that you can sing. They were memorable, but yet they were anointed. And so those first two or three years when they were putting out this new sound from Australia, I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. Nothing wrong was as the deer panteth for the water, but you know, man, I needed something fresh. You know, that's what I needed. And then a friend of mine a few years later handed me a CD and it was live worship from the World Prayer Center from this guy. <laughs> and then, but see, the Lord took me on a journey, and it was, I needed something a little bit deeper now. I wanted something a little bit more, you know, that visitation with the Father in the throne room. And I, I've told the story a hundred times, but, you know, it's like <laughs> listening to that CD on the way to church, and I had to pull over from just weeping in the car. You know, I said, this is the sound for right now that I've been hearing and wanted to hear, but I didn't know how to quantify it, how to put a label on it. Or... So, you know, there's other people that have really touched my life in different ways, and, but, uh, you know, Terry's been probably one of the biggest mentors in my life, you know, as far as how I lead worship and that's that kind of worship that I'm hungry and desperate for. Well, Terry couldn't be my mentor because I'm probably older than him, so... <laughs> Um, you know, when it comes to the whole worship scene, I am older, and so it was at the very beginning. In fact, it was pre-integrity, so there were no CDs really around. So I would have to say it's Pastor's dad, Pastor Senior, man. Um, yeah, he actually started this church saying with eight people saying, I've got nothing to lose. We're just going to stand here and worship. And it wasn't a popular thing. It was in the 70s. <laughs> and I came on board in 79. And, you know, I would just watch him just, hallelujah, just take time. 
and just we would worship. So I just <laughs> you just kind of from his example, just I began to worship. And I remember being on the worship team and kind of I would start singing in the spirit, but I kept my, my mic really low because I thought, I don't want anybody to hear this. I mean, this is, I don't want to be self-conscious and distract people. So I'm just having myself a good time with my mic way down low and just singing in the spirit. But it wasn't because anybody told us to. It was just God. And the way we learn new songs is Pastor Senior would go to Kansas City Convention with his little tape recorder and stand in the middle of the congregation and hold it up. <laughs> and he would record what they're singing and he'd bring it back and he goes, this is what we need to do. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, and I remember being in the office, <laughs> being in the office and they said, you know, it'd be really cool if somebody got the idea to kind of put all these things together and send them out. And within four years, there was integrity. I went, oh, somebody did do that. <laughs> so, yeah, I would have to say it's your dad. That was just the heart of worship. Yeah. Uh, Andre Crouch, for me, in my teenage years, was a great mentor. Uh, and I picked up a lot of his styling, even though I'm a bit of a different culture than he is. Um, but when he would do worship-based stuff, that's what just really rung with my spirit, and there was just a kindredness there. And, um, and then really when I just was getting, it just started into worship leading was just right at the beginning of integrity. And so I started listening to their very first CD with Ron Tucker in St. Louis, Missouri. And um, some of those songs on there just really registered with me. And I thought, wow, this is cool. Because I was just a, I was a pianist or an organist. You know, I wasn't a worship leader uh, until the early 80s. And so that, that was very timely back then. And then, so I would listen to those different worship leaders, Kent Henry and Don Moen and then a few like that. And we don't realize how much, we just glean a little bit of this without even realizing it. You know, some of my sound sometimes can be a sound like Kent Henry or a Don Moen or any number of other guys that just all go someplace in the back of your your soul of just becoming who you are because we are a product of everything around us really i'm an arranger orchestrator and so i would pick up on different anointed arrangers like ron huff and larry goss and bob krogstad and those kind of guys ralph carmichael even and that became who i you know i was talking about barry manilow last night some of that stuff but that became who Terry McGowan would eventually become because that's who we have. We draw from those before us and uh, God just picks and chooses who he wants to form in us. And of course, there's the originality from, from the throne itself that becomes a little bit of our own style too. So it's kind of a, a melting pot of a lot of different elements, I think. That's good. Good stuff. Can you just um, share with us what it was like and kind of when God spoke to you and told you that you were who he wanted to lead people in worship and you kind of, that was the gift he gave you? Can you just kind of share with us what that was like for you all? If only it was that simple. <laughs> I think it's, uh, I think once you're born into this world and you're called, it's kind of like God starts this journey. I don't think it's, uh, you get the letter in the mail. Today is your day. Um, I mean, for me, it was, it was over time. It was, I mean, God had me go through music in high school and stuff, not realizing that was going to be part of my future. You know, it was probably, it was about the mid nineties and just got to that place with God that I was like, God, I want to serve you no matter what the rest of my days. And, and it was like, he said, okay, now you're going to walk into what I called you to do. And that 
was a, and I was reminded that you know all those years of growing up doing music and stuff was all in preparation for that calling. So and then the journey began of just started you know I had to relearn kind of really how to play again because I hadn't picked it up for several years and but I worked at it. I mean I spent my wife would tell you I was up hours at night with the headphones on plugged to that keyboard learning every Hill song song that was coming out till I had it down and. Uh, but then God just started taking me from there, you know, because I was working hard trying to learn the craft, the skill of playing and singing. But at the same time, you know, I also knew I had to spend time with him to get the relationship we talked about. So it just, it just, it just was a process. I think for me it was uh, music had always been a part of my life. I was gifted as a very, very little tiny boy. And, but I did have uh, an experience when I was 18 that I felt God just saying, I'm setting you apart. And this is the road you need to go all the time. I, I was already going that road, but I think I needed, I've drawn back on that experience many times. And it was just an unusual visitation that lasted an hour, hour and a half of just absolute holy glory stuff. And I've never had experienced that intensity before. My pastor at that time came, we were, we were at a youth retreat, so I was kneeling with a prayer buddy and when this visitation happened after the service, and he went and got the pastor, the pastor came and kind of helped me interpret that God was putting his hand on me for a special purpose at that time. So it doesn't happen that way for everyone, as Damon just said, it did that for me. And I, I knew that I knew that I knew, but. I imagine I would have ended up doing it anyway, but there was something special that was being deposited in my spirit that night. I think for me, it was, you call it a journey, just it kind of unfolded. Um, my family's musical, we sang a lot. Um, I don't, the Lord had done something in my life when I was real little, so I just had this passion for him and you know I being remember being a little kid and just crying out and singing you were talking about a hymnal it was page 51 <laughs> and it's like search me oh God and know my heart I pray see if there be some wicked way in me cleanse me and I was 10 years old sobbing <laughs> I'm thinking I'm not sure about all the wicked ways but you know but I <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so true. I don't know. So there's just been this heart for God, and um, <laughs> I don't know. And I actually, I think I realized I was actually called to be worship leader after I'd been leading worship for ten years. And the reason being is, uh, I heard this uh, a pastor friend of mine years ago said, "Ministry makes room for itself," and actually, the Holy Spirit is the one that does that, but. If there is something within you, it will be recognized and acknowledged by the spiritual people, spiritual leadership around you, and they will help you and guide you. But they, it will be recognized. It will be known. And it's not that you elevate, it's the Holy Spirit that starts to do something and kind of um, brings attention to you. You don't bring attention to yourself, but the Holy Spirit does that. And I think that just started to happen because what I always felt like I was supposed to do is preach. And that was really weird in my day because women didn't do that. So I'd stand in front of the, you know, mirror with my brush as my microphone. I'd preach. I wasn't singing. And then they asked me just to start leading and I was like, okay, someday I'll do this until I'm going to preach. <laughs> it's about 10 years into it. It's like, no, this is what you are called. Oh, oh, okay. So, yeah, that's kind of really backwards, but. <laughs> that's great. Good answers. Okay. There you go. Over there? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll let you do it real quick, and then I'll run over there. Okay. I'm not, I don't mean to be a, a question hog, but <laughs> I'm taking care, I'm taking advantage of the mentoring opportunity. Um, I gotta have two questions. One's a, a practical question. Of the other one, I, we probably are, you probably already answered it already, but it's, uh, if you could, if you were to tell a mentoree anything uh, 
someone who feels called to be a part of um, the body and leading worship, what would, that, what would that one or two things, what would those special nuggets be, those nuggets of wisdom? Um, I already imagine what your answer is, but <laughs> um, the second question is um, a practical um, piano question, because I'm a classically trained pianist, and I need to make the transition into keyboard playing. Um, and I guess, and I also have um, background in harpsichord. Um, my question, I guess, is um, do you have any tips or how, how that transition is for you? Because the keyboard has a different feel than, uh, than a, you know, a piano. And, um, and just your transition and how you, how you approach the instrument differently. And, um, you know, what little tips or tricks or equipment has helped you. Like I would, I have to have a pedal you know, or things like that. Those are just little practical things um, that I'm curious about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, for, a, uh, for the piano practical stuff, I always have to have a keyboard that has 88 weighted keys, just like a regular piano would have. If I don't have that, I can't express my, my art, artist's touch It'd be like a Van Gogh trying to paint with a 15-cent paintbrush from Walmart, you know. You've got to have the right tools. So there isn't a big difference if you find the right type of keyboard. If you're a pianist, then, then find a keyboard that has the weighted keys so that you can get the same response that your fingers are used to. Um, that's what my office, when, whenever somebody requests me to come, that's what we say, well, you have to supply an 88 weighted key keyboard. So that's just, and, and any, most of, most of them are, but if you get smaller ones, they don't have the weights in them usually. And that's like playing an organ, that's a whole different thing. So um, that's kind of what I do, and I'm sure Damon feels the same way. And I forgot the first part of your question. I'm sorry. Uh, the nuggets for what? What nuggets would you give to um, mentoring time. somebody starting? So the mentoring thing for me, it's all about humility, and then humility, and after that, humility. <laughs> and it's an endless quest, and I'm not halfway there yet. But um, God seeks authentic humility, not perceived. People can perceive you're humble and you can be the proudest guy in the church. Um, so it's between your heart and God's heart. That's when he's going to trust you with more, when he sees an authentic, humble heart. It's a biggie. It's, a, just, it's the biggest thing. There's no room for personality and celebrity in worship leading. It's different from being a performer, a singer, a uh, rock band or a Christian band. Worship is a whole different animal. No room for personality. Unfortunately, we see a lot of personality uh, because it's become kind of a trendy, artsy thing to do is to sing worship songs. But when you have to change the whole inflection of your voice and it becomes somebody that you aren't even, you don't talk that way, but when you sing, you go into this alter ego. I don't buy that for worship. That's a stylistic thing that doesn't belong in worship to me. You just need to sing. You need to be your little individual heart unto God. Personal opinion. I agree with the personal opinion. So it's <laughs> what the, the two words that came to mind when you asked was humble diligence. Um, and then he just mentioned, Terry just mentioned humility. In two areas, humble diligence in, in whatever the skill level is, musically, if you're talking about being a worship leader, and humble diligence in your relationship with Jesus Christ and coming into the Holy Spirit. So I would say in those two levels, humble diligence. And I'll finish it off with humility. And I know that we're saying the same thing here, but I'm telling you, humility is the key. And I would even go in obedience. God is going to ask and require you to do things that you didn't think you could do. And he wants to know, are you willing to go the journey all the way? And this question got asked to me once before on an interview. What would you do if you were looking for a worship leader for your church? And my response was, can they worship without an audience? 
Because if they can't, then they can't worship in front of the people. I mean, because they don't know where to take them. If they've never been with him, how can they take somebody with them? And so, and you're right, humility can be perceived, but humility, in my opinion, is one of the most important ingredients for what he's talking about, a real worship leader, not a Christian artist. Two different, two different things. And an experience that I uh, talked about even still was that when I met Darlene Check, just real quickly, and, um, she was a Willow Creek, I believe. That's the one thing I walked away from, is that that is probably one of the most humble person I have ever... My Lord, you could feel it. She was, there was so much humility coming off of her. I, that's the one thing I always remember more than anything else about meeting her is the humbleness that she had. And you got thousands of people waiting to meet this person. And she was very gracious to just speak a little bit to you and just, wow, just, I was in awe of that. So humility and obedience is key. And as far as the instrument goes, ditto. 88 weighted key. You can't beat it. On Terry's website, he has a great article about humility. If anybody has missed that, you would want to go there. I think it's on your blog, Terry. Newglory.org. Okay. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, then I want to know between Leanne and Terry if they use the same cassette player. Because I might be the only one in the world that has one besides you two. <laughs> when you talked about... Uh, his father coming back to the church, but Terry singing hallelujah on there. But anyway, my question is, when you are just feeling stuck, just like there's no desire to go forward or no desire to go backwards and just no feeling, how do you get unstuck? How do you, I know praise and worship breaks it loose, um, but I'm coming more from, uh, from life itself, but I know it would definitely be involved with writing music or singing music. So it's that quietness that you only desire God, but you can't get there to him. You can't, I don't know if that makes sense, but. Uh. Well, I know God is the God of movement, but there were times when he, you know, he said, be still and stop and stand and see. And um, in terms of feeling stuck or having no feelings, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, because to me, it's almost two different things. Feeling stuck you just trust. Well, maybe in both cases, even if you don't feel anything, I think obedience is the key. Because following Christ isn't about our emotions, it's about obedience. The emotions are the after of effect, and, and God is so gracious. And, and the reason I say this too, uh, Irene Tompkins was speaking once, and she said the Lord took her through he took all the all feelings away, emotional feelings away, and he for five years, and said, "What are you going to do with me now?" You know, and she said, "It wasn't an, I didn't feel this or feel that because he took that. It was a matter of obedience." And it, Lord, and her response was, "Lord, it doesn't matter what I feel. I'm going to do what you've called me to do," and so. Um, I think in this day and age, we're a very me-centered society, and so feelings are huge, you know. Um, and we have to kind of, you know, when Terry said the church has kind of walked away a lot, we've walked away from truth a lot. So I think we just obey. We obey. And he restores when he's going to restore. He promises he'll do it. Sometimes I need someone else to pray for me because I can't pray for myself. But um, he's the lover of my soul. And I love him. So it's obedience. I don't know. Does anybody else? 
Okay, this, maybe six months ago, my son opened his arms and his daughter walked into his arms and he just held her closely. And that has started me on this process and where the process has gone so far is in my spirit realm God put me at the end of this oblong maybe like water you know it's a oblong shape and then he put my earthly father at the other end then he asked me to go to my father, earthly father, who's been deceased 40 some years, and let him hold me. And I screamed, no, I wouldn't do it. Okay, these are very, this is a long thing that happened, but I'm high speeding it. But gradually I said, if Jesus will go with me, I will walk to my earthly father. So Jesus came, his arm was around my waist, and I cried and screamed, but I got about three-fourths to my father, my earthly father, and I have refused and can't go there. Now, I know that's where I'm stuck, but it's okay if I'm stuck, <laughs> you know, because I know he's going to take me the rest of the way. Um, he's so patient and gentle like you have all talked about. So maybe that's the part that I'm asking you. It's, it's such an amazing event because here my father's been deceased for 40 some years and I'm refusing to go into his arms, you know. But God's want me to let my earthly father hold me. So I know that's why I can't completely freely go to my heavenly father, as although I love him with all my heart, I still can't go to my earthly father. And somehow there's a huge connection between... Sounds like at some point you've got, you have some pain. So at this, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> so to me, the issue is healing. As God heals your heart, you will walk closer. So at, to me, it's a matter of just allowing your heart to be healed. And maybe a forgiveness piece is in there because healing comes through forgiveness as well. Or just, you know, um, injustices happen. And, and, you know, we like to hold the baton of justice and it shouldn't have or whatever and but the forgiveness just releases and drops the baton and says you know I am not going to beat you in my memory anymore or, or nothing I'm just gonna be healed so so I think healing and forgiveness is in a piece there and that's probably why you're stuck with that particular issue and then you'll finish your walk I don't know and I, and I think that the problem that you're having because of your earthly father is a problem that 42 bajillion people have yeah, in their worship Excellent. relationship. I really couldn't sit on my dad's lap, therefore, can I really sit on yours, father? And it's a mental block that has to be dealt with. And I always try to get back to, to the, the, the very simplistic thing. If Terry McAlman was the only individual on the planet Earth, God would have sent Jesus to rescue me. That's a lap I can sit on, because what love was that? What, that blows my mind with love. And if I can just understand that kind of love for this long, I can get up on his lap and let those arms come around me. Because he's, if he didn't leave me at the cross, he's never gonna leave me now. Helps me. Yeah. Well, thank you for great questions and uh, if you're watching uh, online or watching this later um, no doubt uh, you've learned a lot uh, your website one more time if you could just say it newglory.org 
newglory.org, and it sounds like you have a blog there and some other things as well. Blog, so. products, events, the yeah. whole potato. Good. Damon, you have a website for anybody that's watching or... Stewart.com. DamonStewart.com. Leanne? ChristianLifeChurch.org. ChristianLifeChurch.org. <laughs> you need to hold the Leanne there, but uh, I know that they're here. Uh, these are our coaches. Can we say thank you with a round of applause for this uh, great session?